Over the years, I have designed a lot of different PC cases. However, they have all been built around ITX or Micro ATX motherboards, and never around an ATX motherboard. Until now. This is my first ever ATX design, and it's actually proven to be quite the challenge. Mainly due to the fact that to make the design printable on the most common printer sizes, panels had to be split. So the main challenge was to figure out a way to have these splits while still having a chassis that was strong, but also would look good. When I asked you guys what was important when choosing a 3D printable ATX case, the biggest group of you said that it should be easy to print and easy to build, while still having easy access to all the components. The case requires a build plate size of only 180 by 180 millimeters, which means it's printable on most of the commonly available printers on the market, including the Prusa Mini or Bamboo A1 Mini, and all panels were designed to be printed without requiring any support material. The case also supports tons of cooling options like radiators, fans and many air coolers, as well as a large graphics card up to 335mm in length. All of this combined with an overall case size of only 360 by 360 by 200 mm makes this a potentially very powerful yet relatively compact ATX system. The case was designed using Shaper 3D, and overall it requires roughly 2.5 kg of filament to print. Almost every panel of the build has its own part number embedded into it, which makes the building process very easy. The build starts by grabbing part 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. These parts will when joined together become one of the two side panels of the case. Before joining the panels, make sure all the five numbers are oriented in the same way which is the way they're supposed to be read. Then all four panels can simply slide in at a 45 degree angle onto the cross piece until they click into place in the middle. Now, what's cool about this joint is how it's possible to now join four panels with one single main joint. However, we still want to make sure the panels stay where they are. Therefore, we can add these butterfly joints, which will clamp the panels together. This way, the panels get locked in more than one direction, resulting in those five panels now feeling like one solid piece. The benefit of joining parts this way is that the panel has almost no flex to it at all. Next naturally comes panel number 6 and 7. Here we have to make a choice, because we have some different options. We have one option where we can use an ATX power supply at the bottom, as well as a 120mm exhaust fan at the top. The other option is to use a top mounted SFX power supply, and a bottom panel that lets you utilize all the PCIe slots of an ATX motherboard. Then we have the third option, which is to use a SFX power supply at the bottom of the case with a 120mm exhaust fan at the top. When you've made your choice, the panels can be added to the side panel just like this. However, we first need to install a few threaded inserts. Keep in mind that these holes are designed to be used with 4.6mm wide M3 inserts and not the 5mm ones which I accidentally used when I recorded this clip. The panels can then be secured to the side panel by using M3 by 10mm screws, which will also be the standard screw size for all the screws used in this build. Before attaching the two panels, we need to install a couple of threaded inserts into the bottom of panel number 6. These are added for extra rigidity and even though there's only one hole in the clip in the video, I will have added an extra hole to the design you guys can download, to prevent this flex right here. After part number 6 and 7 comes part number 8, which is a magnet bracket. This bracket requires two more threaded inserts to be melted in place, one in panel 6 and one in panel 7. The bracket then secures in place using two more M3 screws. Let's now grab panel 9, 10, 12, 13, 15 and 17. While our soldering iron is still hot, let's add the remaining threaded inserts now to make the rest of the build super easy. There are quite a few threaded inserts to install, so my suggestion is to use this picture as a reference on where to place those inserts. Keep in mind to also add inserts to the sides where you see the yellow arrows. The arrows indicate where to add these side inserts into three of the parts. After part number 8 comes panel number 9, which secures in place with two M3 screws from the rear through the bottom of panel 7, and also two more M3 screws from the inside of the case. This one in the corner can be a little tricky to access, so just take your time here. Then we can add panel number 10 and secure it with two more screws to the side panel, 
followed by magnet bracket number 11, which will secure the two panels together using two more M3 screws. It's now time to move on to panel 12 and 13, which mounts just like the two previous panels by using two screws on the side panel. Next, we can add two more screws at the bottom corner through the holes in panel 10 into the side of panel 12. Magnet bracket number 14 can then be added between 12 and 13 by using three more M3 screws. Now, let's grab panel 15 and 17, which make up the top of the case, and secure them just like the four previous panels by using two screws on each panel from the inside. In the rear upper corner of the case, we can join panel 6 to panel 17 by adding two screws from the outside of the case. At this point, panel 15 is still a little wobbly. We're adding this corner bracket, which is numbered 16, on the inside. The bracket secures in place using two screws, one on each panel, which makes for a strong and reliable connection. Then it's just a matter of installing magnet bracket number 18 with three more M3 screws and just like that our internal chassis is almost complete. If you're still watching at this point, that probably means that you like what you see. Why not leave a like and consider following the channel so you don't miss out on any future projects just like this and better. And I promise you, there's a lot of cool stuff coming. Anyways, at this point in the build, it's time to add some 8 by 3 mm neodymium magnets. These simply push into the magnet brackets and probably need a tiny amount of glue to keep in place. And we want to add a total of 12 magnets to the main chassis of the case in the locations in this picture marked red. One tip is to stack the magnets like this before pushing them into place, then simply add them one at a time from the same stack making sure not to flip the stack between each magnet. This way you know they'll all get the same polarity which will make things easier later on. When they're all in place, let's put the main chassis over to the side for a bit before grabbing panel 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23. These five parts make up the removable magnetic side panel and assemble by pushing the parts together at a 45 degree angle before pushing in place the butterfly joints, which may or may not require to be glued or melted into place. Let's now flip the panel around so the numbers are upside down when you read them. This way you align the bottom of the panel with the bottom of the chassis. Now, if we were smart and installed all the magnets previously with the same polarity, then this part is gonna be super simple because we all know that magnets have one side that attracts and one side that rejects another magnet. And since we want the magnets to stick to each other, we actually want to find out which side of the magnet that rejects the other magnet already installed. Why, you may ask. Well, by finding the side that rejects, you know that that's the side you want facing away from the magnet when it's installed. Which again means that that's the side you wanna add some glue to and push into the hole because then the side that's facing out of the panel will be the magnetic side that attracts to the opposing magnet. Another option is to add magnets to the already installed magnets, then mark the outside with a sharpie to know which side should have glue on it, and then add them one by one into the opposing hole. When all the magnets are in place, we can test fit the panel to see if it fits correctly. The build has now come a long way from that stack of panels we started with, but we're still not completely done yet. At this point, we can add the threaded inserts for our motherboard standoffs, which this time have been included into the design, so that now you can actually use the same threaded inserts as the rest of the build instead of having to buy separate standoffs. We are now ready to add our motherboard, and I will actually be using a micro ATX board because I simply do not own an ATX board, but the process will be the exact same. Before adding the motherboard to the chassis, make sure to add any CPU cooler backplate or simply pre-install your preferred CPU cooler as the back of our motherboard will be hard to reach once it's installed. Our motherboard can then be secured in place using M3 screws. The front of the chassis can hold up to two 120mm intake fans or two 140mm intake fans. And the same goes for radiators, you can mount either a 240 or a 280mm radiator in the front. And at the top we can fit either two 120mm fans or, as I will be using, a 240mm top mounted radiator, which secures in place from the top of the case. We must also remember to add a 12mm power button to this hole up here. And I'll be sure to add a link in the video description to a button that should work here. Even with the radiator in the top, we can still fit two 140 or two 120mm fans in the front and these fans secure in place with regular fan screws, just like in most other cases. Now it's really starting to look like a computer. 
but we're still missing some parts. When it comes to power supplies, this case can take an ATX power supply at the bottom like this. However, you can also use a SFX power supply if you prefer that, by using the correct rear panel. One thing to keep in mind if using an ATX power supply is this area right here, which will be partially blocked by the power supply once it's installed. There is still some space, but it's quite tight, so all cables we want to attach to this small area should be installed before carefully adding the power supply, making sure not to squeeze any cables too hard. In front of the power supply, we can add another 120 or 140 mm intake fan to provide fresh air to the GPU, and it secures in place the same way as the other fans. I'm personally going to use a SFX power supply in my setup, as that's what I have available that has enough power for my components. Okay, so at this point all I've done is to add my power supply, added all my power cables and tucked away the cables all the way in the back there and cleaned it up with some zip ties. You may also notice that I'm using a 24 pin extension cable for my PSU as my stock cable was just a few millimeters too short to reach the motherboard connector. I have also added this 120mm slim fan as an exhaust fan and swapped out the front fans with the same type, mainly for aesthetic reasons. It's now time to add our graphics card, and if using an ATX power supply you should be fine with any card with a thickness up to 3 slots or about 61mm to secure the graphics card and other PCIe cards in place. We can melt in place some threaded inserts, however this is a little tricky given the location of these holes. We can also just use an M3 screw and the nut on the other side through the hole, both will work fine. After plugging in the last power cables, we can move on to the final stage of this build. But first, one other feature worth mentioning is this cutout in the top panel, which gives you easy access to all the connectors at the top of the motherboard, like CPU power and fan headers. To cover up all the screws, we have some external panels that will slide into the tracks on the main chassis. One of these panels has a cutout to fit around the power button, and this panel slides in first. Next, we have another panel that is just plain but has a little latch on the inside of it. This latch should align with this cutout in the main chassis, so that when the panel is slid into place, it should latch in place and stay there. But it's still easily removable just by lifting it slightly in the middle before pulling it out. Moving over to the front of the case, we have two more external panels to add. One plain panel that will slide in first all the way up to the top, followed by another panel which has my logo embedded into it. And the logo panel should also have a latching mechanism just like the top panel. To prepare the logo panel, we simply print the logo emblem and push it into place in the panel, followed by the little centerpiece and it may or may not require glue to stay in place. We can now move on to the bottom case where we have our two final slide-in pieces, which also make up the feet of the case. One of the panels has a little notch on one end, and that one should go into the slide first, and that little notch goes into the rear panel of the case. The second panel then follows, and on this one the latching piece is on the main chassis, while the locking hole is on the panel itself. A good final touch is to add some soft feet to the bottom of the case to give it a more premium feel. After making sure all cables, power buttons and components are plugged in correctly, we're ready to drop into place our magnetic side panel. And just like that, our new ATX case is complete. I am so happy with how this turned out, and especially the pattern on the side panels really helped to make those joining lines a natural part of the design. That, combined with an all-mesh middle section, allows this case to get a great forced airflow through the entire case, allowing you to keep your components cool and relatively quiet during heavy loads. Now, if you found my video instructions somewhat hard to follow, you can also find full written instructions on printables with explaining photos and detailed descriptions of every step of the build as written instructions have been requested by quite a few people. And my main goal is always to make these projects as easy as possible to assemble and that also seems to be what you guys prefer. Now, you may have asked yourself this question already. Where are the hard drives? Well, even though most modern systems will be fine with just M.2s on the motherboard, I know that a lot of people still prefer to use hard drives, so don't worry, I've got you covered. This is a 2 bay drive cage and this cage requires the use of 4 M3 threaded inserts and this drive bay replaces the front intake fan and secures in place using M3 screws from the front of the case. With some thin brackets installed onto each side of the drive, they simply slide into the track and will latch into place. 
and they are not coming back out unless you push the two brackets together to release the latch before you pull it out. I'm also planning to design some brackets that allow you to use 2.5 inch drives as well, which will be added to printables. Using the hard drive cage will somewhat reduce the maximum GPU length you can fit, but you'll still be able to fit cards up to about 260mm in length. And by replacing both front intake fans, you can actually fit a total of up to four 3.5 inch drives. Without the drives, we can use GPUs up to about 335mm in length. And in terms of GPU height, even the super large 3090 Founders Edition had absolutely no problem fitting into this case. And that's even with a 15mm thick front intake fan already installed. Now, over to some performance testing. When running Cinebench on my i9-10900K with the 240mm AIO, the temperatures had an initial peak of 73 degrees before it stabilized at just over 60 degrees during the rest of the test. When running Fermark on my Gigabyte 3070, the GPU would peak just over 70 degrees during this test. However, during normal FPS gaming, the GPU would mostly stay in the range of around 65 degrees and therefore also be a bit quieter and all these temperatures were recorded in an ambient room temperature of about 24 degrees. If you're interested in making this case for yourself or a friend, you can access the files by joining my printables club for as little as a cup of coffee a month. But you're also able to make an individual model purchase if you prefer that. Feel free to also check out some of my other models available. Maybe there's another one that suits your needs even better. Feel free to check out the files or preview them through the link in the video description. One thing to keep in mind when you become a club member is that when you sign up, you'll get an automatic welcome email which contains an invite link for my Discord server, where you can get direct access to me and other members to discuss projects or 3D printing in general. Maybe this wasn't just the right project for you, but perhaps the next one might be. Make sure to leave a thumbs up and follow my channel so you don't miss out on all the cool stuff coming in the next months. Thank you so much for watching and I really hope to see you again in my upcoming project videos.